He's talking about our blessed hope we have in Jesus Christ. I fear that for too many Christians, we are Christians for the time here and now, and we don't think about the blessed hope over yonder. I fear that there's too many Christians who are thinking about what can I get out of Christ here on this earth and give very little thought about their life in heaven with God. I want you to stop that. I want you to think about this thing that God has provided for us is not just time sensitive. It is an eternal matter that forever and ever and ever and on into forever, we are going to be over yonder with God and it is going to be a marvelous, wonderful improvement upon what we have here on earth. Most Christians on earth today spend all their time, much of their time, thinking about the here and now. Our great hope is in the revelation of Jesus Christ. When I say revelation, our great hope is in the revealing of Jesus at the rapture of the church. When he comes back, hovers in the sky, and he reaches out in his own divine way, and he brings in all those who have accepted him by faith, raptures them. It's called snatching them off the earth in Thessalonians and takes us on into heaven while leaving the tear here behind, leaving all those who rejected him and scoffed him, all the critics and all the skeptics, all those who said, I don't believe in you, God. I don't want to hear your word. He takes us out of here, and we sail on into glory, and there we find our purpose for life and our reason for existence even while we were on earth. That day's coming. I don't know when it'll be. I like to think it might be soon. I look at this world, these are some crazy times, no doubt. But there's been crazy times in the past, real crazy times. I remember 30 years ago thinking it can't get no worse than this. I remember 10 years ago thinking it can't get no worse than this. Ain't no telling what five years is going to look like in the future. So Jesus could come back tonight, Lord, come quickly. It's okay. And we ain't got nothing else on this earth better than what he's got for us over in heaven. Or he can wait another 10,000 years before he comes. Why? Because he is God. And he said when he comes, he's coming as a thief in the night. You know what it means? He's coming when you don't expect him. He'll come when you're not looking for him. When you don't think he's coming, he's coming. And when he comes... He's going to come as a thief in the night, meaning that he will come in the rapture and he will take us out of here and people will wake up the next morning, look around and say, where did they go? It's like when somebody breaks into your home, you're off on vacation or something and you come back and you're excited about being back at home and you pull up in the driveway and your door's standing open and you walk in and the house is absolutely ransacked. You say, what happened? Thieves came in and stole everything we've got that's unpacked. The only difference about Jesus is the thief in the night, he ain't coming as a thief to stealing anything. He paid for everything he's coming back for with his precious blood. Amen. What it means is he's coming in a time you don't expect him. And those who don't accept him as their Lord and Savior are going to be overwhelmed with, oh my goodness, it must have been true. Satan and his false prophecies and prophets will explain it away by something crazy. Maybe that's why we're having so much talk nowadays about uh, UFOs and say maybe they'll say, well, they came and some UFOs took all our people away. I got news for you. We know this one who's coming for us. He's been preached for over 2,000 years as the one who came. He was preached for thousands of years as the one who's coming. Jesus Christ is coming one day, and we need to know how to live till he comes. Till he comes. How shall we live? Get your mind ready for what God wants to do in your life. And he's talking about here and now. We got a heaven to look forward to. Oh, yes. But how shall we live till he comes? The revelation of Jesus Christ. He is our hope. He is our focus looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Keep believing in him. Shut out the foolishness of this world and focus on living for him. 
Now that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you, if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior here today, would you just simply shout out amen? amen? I like that testimony. Now I know I'm among friends, and so I'll just share it this way. For you, he's saying, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, it was then you should have drew a line in the sand and says, I ain't crossing that line. I'm walking with Jesus Christ. I'm going to suppress the lust of the flesh. And that word lust there is not just, it is certainly, but it's not just talking about sexual lust. It's talking about any uh, earthly desires that God would be displeased with you. And he says, you stop it. He's talking about, he's fixing to reveal to us what's called a holy life. Walking as a person of holiness with God. Meaning that who we were, we're not no more. We used to walk and, and do whatever we wanted to do, live any way we wanted to live and enjoy the flesh of this world as much as we can. But when you gave your life to Jesus, you said, I've lived for the devil long enough. Now it's time to live for Jesus Christ. And you are now a holy being saying, I will follow you. I will be obedient to you. I will live for you. We don't do it to be saved. We do it because we are saved. When you get saved, you're saved by the grace of God, which he already revealed there. But once saved by the grace of God, we live by obedience to his grace. How wonderful a gift you gave me. My God, I will give my whole life to follow you. Not so I can stay saved, but because I am saved, I want to respect you. I want to appreciate you. I want to honor you. I want to glorify you. That's how Christians ought to live. We shouldn't, man, we shouldn't live a life that says, how close can I live to the edge and still make it to heaven? That's foolishness. How close can I live to my mighty God who gave his life? God, the Father, sent his Son for us. And the Son says, I sure will. I will take away the barrier between God and sinful man, holy God and sinful man. I will take that barrier away, and he hung on that cross, became our sin debt, paid it all, that we might be saved. Now, saved, we look at our lives and say, if you save me to a life of holiness, I want to live that life in purity, in harmony with God. So I sacrifice, you sacrifice of those desires of the flesh because the desire of the Spirit is to honor him and to walk in harmony with him. He goes, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance. The reason you did it, the reason any of you is doing it, is because you're ignorant of what you have been offered. Well, ignorance, it's not a, it's not a word of saying you're ignorant, being hateful. It's a word of saying you just don't know what you're missing. I remember sitting down at the table when I was a little boy, and I would turn my nose up to something, and my grandma would say, boy, you don't know what you're missing. Try that. You'll like it. And most of the time, I would. I would. And so, we, in our ignorance, living after the flesh, we didn't know what we was missing, but now we've accepted Christ, and we've, we've tasted the good grace of God. We say, my Lord, I want more. I want to live for you. I want to be obedient. I want to experience you more. And so we live as obedient children before God. And then he says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And so here is Peter. Do you know who Peter was? Peter was like, he was like one of the top guys with Jesus. He was one of the guys that walked with Jesus all the time. Peter was an incredibly holy guy. I know he fell, but the grace of God washes away all our sins. I mean, you know, he denied Jesus three times right before Jesus went and died on the cross. And then after Jesus rose from the grave, Peter could have denied him, but chose rather to die. And he died on a cross, and he said, hang me upside down because I ain't worthy to hang upright like my Savior because he saw the resurrection. Peter was that great preacher of the Jerusalem. He was the great, he was the, he was the pastor of the first cowboy church, Jerusalem. Okay, it wasn't the cowboy church. But he was the pastor of the first church, church Jerusalem. What an incredible man. He's preaching along. These books he's written are wonderful. He's telling us, you be holy 
like your heavenly Father is holy. We say, I can't. So what do you do? Because you can't, you don't. Because you can't, you don't try to please him, to try to obey him, try to live according to his will. We live by faith in his grace, absolutely, 100%, only way we're going to get to heaven. But once saved, we sacrifice of our fleshy desires that we may live that holy life. What does it mean to be holy? It means to be set apart for God and his service. Jesus, when he came to this earth, he was holy. He's always been holy. He was tempted on all points that were tempted, but he never sinned. You can read Hebrews chapter 4. But Jesus, he came as a man on a mission, born to die. Perfectly holy in every way, came to take our sin. Why were you born? Why are you here? What's the point of your life? Is it? Is it to get up every morning and go to work and then work all day long? Some of you get up in the evening and have to go to work work all night long. But is it that you go every day, working every day, come home and enjoy a little bit of downtime and then collapse in the bed and get up the next morning with a big old cup of coffee and try to make it through another day? Is that the purpose of life? Oh, and you live for the weekend so you can party all weekend long. Is that really the purpose of life? Oh, come on, y'all. No, it's not the purpose of life. is to get up in the morning and say, my God, I am your child. I don't care what you want from me. I give it. Whatever you ask of me, I was set out to do that. I believe you have given me life to live for you. Show me how you want me to live. And you live your life to glorify you. Holy life. Somebody says, man, I'm not going to do that. It's not worth it. Then you have not properly calculated what was given to you through Jesus Christ. When you gird up your mind, Roll up the sleeves of your mind and you think, the wonderful Lord gave me life in eternity with him forever. Then there has to be that great spirit of appreciation that causes you to sacrifice everything to follow after him. If you're a sincere follower of Christ, it does. Do we fail? Yeah, that's why the grace of God cleanses us from all sin. But at the same time, we're saying, everything that I am, I want this to bring honor and glory to God. And he made, he, he, he created every one of you for a reason. You've got a reason in your life for being here. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing that God created you with a reason, a purpose to live, and you did everything but that? You accomplished this over here and that over there, but none of it was what God wanted you to do. I say you seek out for God's will in your life. His first will is that you turn to him by faith and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's by far the first will of God, the first thing you ought to accomplish. But then after that, you sit out the rest of your life saying, I don't know what you got for me, Lord, but I know this. I'm yours I'm here for you, and all I want to know is how do you want me to live? You should be praying, God, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. And you should be praying, God, guide my steps and help me to live to bring glory and honor to you. And you live your life every day. You're a careful, you're a careful pilgrim in this land. You carefully move through this life. You evaluate the things that you allow into your life. And you are consistently rebuking things out of your life. And you're seeking out to be that one that God looks down from heaven and says, this child is living a life of holiness. And all the world can ridicule you and laugh at you when you stand firm for God. The whole world can say, oh, how foolish you are. There's so much fun out there and you're wasting it. You live for God, don't you? He loves you. And you look forward to that future hope of the revelation of Jesus Christ because he is coming back for you someday. Verse 17, without partiality, he judges according to each one's work. Your works as a Christian matters. And that's what our world needs to hear today because we're preaching a whole lot of cheap grace. The grace of God is so wonderful. 
And yet Satan comes along and even perverts grace to make it cheap grace. And it says something like this. Well, if you've accepted Jesus by faith, it really doesn't matter how you live on this earth because all your sins are covered, so it doesn't matter. It does matter. If you gave your life to Jesus, you gave your life to Jesus. That means if I give him my life, I'm saying my life is no longer mine. It is yours, and whatever you call on me to do, I'm going to do it. Not so that I can be saved, but because I am saved, I want to glorify you. That's how Christians should live. He says, conduct yourselves throughout time of your stay here in fear. What does he mean? When he talks about fear, he's talking about fear of God. And this church full of people right here, I'm telling you, we ought to be God-fearing people. And, of course, there's a lot of so-called Christian peoples out there who say, well, you don't have to fear God. You just respect Him. You honor Him. You don't have to fear Him. Listen to me. I don't want to lose what God wants to offer. I fear that I displease him. I fear that I dishonor him. I fear that I hurt him by my behavior and my actions. Rather, I want to live in the fear of God, saying, God, you're always right, and I mess up. I pray you'll forgive me. Get my feet back on the solid rock and help me to live like you want me to live. I want to live a Christian life in the fear of God. Peter talks about the fear of God. You were saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Take that into account as you live your life. You were saved by the precious blood of Jesus. What does that mean? It means God the Father sent his son. His son came and he died on the cross. His blood was shed to wash your sins away. His precious blood for you. And how can I, realizing that God would leave heaven, be born as a man on earth, die on a cross for my sins, rise from the grave and say, if you want to be saved, follow me and, and give your life to me. And you do. And how can you say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. I get, my, I get saved, man, and I'm going to go to heaven. But while I'm on this earth, man, I'm going to live it up because I got the grace of God. No, man, that is like trampling under your feet the precious blood of Jesus. Is there no more honor? Is there no more respect in you than that? Man, it ought to set us back on our heels and say, Oh, God, what sacrifice you made for us. My God, I will, I will dedicate every ounce of me to you. I'm going to live for you. And Jesus was revealed to them in person. How, how was he revealed? He was revealed by a miracle birth, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, and a, and a miracle life as he lived his life here on this earth. He lived such a substitutionary life that even in his lifetime on this earth, he was not spared the hardships of life, but he went through it just like we did. Do you understand that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, lived on this earth for 33 and a half years, and because of that, he knows the troubles and trials that you have. He knows your hurts, he knows your haunts, he knows all the problems that you have, and he sees it, and he loves you, and he wants to bless your life. But to bless your life, you need to turn to him by faith and be saved. And being saved, he wants you to turn to him and work and live for his glory, not to keep your salvation, but because you are saved. You're dedicated to live for him no matter what. And if you've got problems in your life that you know, this stands between me and God. Here is a problem in my life that stands between me and God. Then you ought to have enough respect for the God who came and saved your soul to say, God, I don't care what I have to do. This sin is getting out of my life. I'm going to stop this. Or maybe you're neglecting a work that he's called you to do, like maybe reading your Bible. One of the most effective things that transform your life is to read your Bible daily. And you can say, you know, I, I'm slack here. I haven't done it. God, I don't care what I have to do. I'm going to change that behavior. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to live for you. That's respect for God. He goes on, and he says, Verse 21, who through him, believe in God who raised him from the dead. He ain't dead no more, is he, y'all? No, sir, Jesus is alive and he's coming back one day. And gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. It ain't in your good works. It's in God. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, Love one another fervently with a pure heart. Hey, man, here, here is a good 
litmus test for a follower of Jesus Christ? It's do you love the brethren? It means Christians should love each other. And not just passively. We should love each other fervently. Sounds good. But it's difficult. Because there's so many different types of misunderstandings, different types of confusion Satan puts in the way. And we get an edge to one another. And I say, nah, just don't do that. Instead, let's be those people who act more like God. You know what God does? He forgives. That's what he does. You know what God does? He concedes and he blesses and he does everything he can to, to make the fellowship right. And so, brothers and sisters here, let's love one another and let's forgive one another and let's keep living for Jesus Christ. I thank God for this church. This has been one of the most loving churches I've ever pastored. I'm telling you, this has been a wonder. We got a good church here, and I'm proud of you. But Satan desires to get in at all times, and so beware of that. He goes on, verse 23, this is so good. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but an incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. He says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed. That is a reference to Adam and Eve, fallen human beings, who were now in sin, and when they had their babies, they were born with their original sin in their life. And it don't matter who you are, how good you live, you need a Savior. Because you physically were born with corruptible seed, but whenever you get saved, you are born again, not with corruptible seed, but by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, and you're born again. Now you have that spiritual life. That which is born of the flesh, it is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that you must be born again. The question is, have you been born again? And if you were not, you need to be born again today. You say, well, how can I be born again? You turn to the one, Jesus Christ, who came and he died for you. He took your penalty, your punishment on the cross. He rose from the grave and he's there at the Father. Do you know what Jesus is doing for you right now? He's praying for you. To if you're not a Christian, he's praying that you'll get saved. Jesus is. Turn to the Father and say, God, draw that one to be saved. If you're feeling God knocking at your heart's door right now, if you feel that God is calling you to be saved, you feel that drawing vacuum of God pulling you toward him, don't resist it because you don't know when you're going to get another chance. But instead, if, if the almighty, wonderful God who created all things and gave his son for you and he's drawing you, then you're going to say, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it. What are you talking about? This is the greatest offer you'll ever experience. Don't run from it, run to it. You turn to him by faith and say, today, Jesus, I'm accepting your offer of free salvation and I'm accepting the life that you give me, and I will live a holy life in your sight. I remember whenever the man was talking to me about being saved, I remember thinking, I could never, I could never live good enough. I could never live good enough. And then I realized uh, his grace covers all my sin. So I gave Jesus my life, and then I realized his grace helps me to live for him. And even when I fail, I'm able to confess that sin. He just keeps me, and he takes care of me. I'm the most unlikely guy, but God saved me. And it don't matter who you are, where you live, or what you've done, or what's going on in your life, if you would just turn to him by faith now, he will save your soul. Give your life to Jesus today. Surrender to his call on your heart. Be saved. Simply turn to him in prayer and ask him to forgive you and to save your soul. And then commit your life to following him.